spot the frog, you don't know who to who I am. I'm a business executive for PAD specialist, and then I'm also the chairman of the board for the Laredo Chamber of Commerce. So, so my, my, the whole last year, what I've been saying, and I truly believe this, Laredo is the future of North America. Laredo is the future of North America, but the future is now. That's what I've realized the last three months, is the future is now. So Laredo might be the future of North America, but the future is now. So we need to, with Laredo being the number one port in the Western Hemisphere, we need to continue to innovate. We need to continue to be that, that leader. And we don't, we don't ever want to lose that, that designation as the number one port in the Western Hemisphere. The only way, though, that we stay that way is if we innovate, we get better. We have to get better. Recently, I was out in Los Angeles and in, and in San Diego, and I was visiting the port, the ports out there, uh, and I was really impressed with their their push to market innovation. I was I was shocked. I was like, wow, they're 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 pushing the the marketing aspect of innovation of what they're doing. They're they're building a brand there. With the Inflation Reduction Act and with the Justice 40 component behind that, it gives our community the opportunity to catch up. It gives our community the opportunity to be able to get federal dollars that we might not have been able to get before if it hadn't been for this legislation. It's really important that we learn about this stuff. Uh, so I think all of you guys know this, but in order to get better as a, as a community, in order to get better as we need to continue to innovate, continue to get better, continue to figure out ways to run faster. I think one thing that is important, really important though, that we know is that in order for Laredo to stay on top and for Laredo to break out of its shell per se, is that we need to run two times faster than everybody else. So while someone's running maybe five miles per hour, ten miles, we need to run faster than that. Because if we don't do that, we are going to be, they're, they're going to catch up to us, and they're going to leave us behind. So we have to run faster. So, you know, in, in today's world, well, I think it is what it is, right? Where we're, the amount of energy that's being produced, the amount of energy that's needed nowadays is, is out of the world, right? There's this mind-boggling stat that I heard uh, a few weeks ago from, Richard, from Representative Raymond talking about the amount of energy that's out there. So we know that the that industry is going that way. I think that the, the best way I explain it to people is it's kind of looking at the Affordable Care Act back in 2010. And the Affordable Care Act said, okay, all medical records needed to go on electronic form. And there was a lot of pushback from medical practices back then. And, but what happened back then is that there was, there was funding opportunities for doctor's offices to be able to get on EMRs early. The earlier they adapt to EMR, the, er, the more money they got up front. Now, if they were adapted to an EMR in 2020, then they weren't going to be able to get as much federal funding from that. But if they would have done that in 2010, they would have probably had their entire uh, EMR infrastructure on, you know, for given to them with federal funding. That's the way I'm looking at it right now. I think that we need to remember that, you know, Tesla is one of the most uh, is one of the most valuable companies in the world for a reason. Uh, I think that I, I really think that the amount of energy that we're consuming, we need to be able to figure out ways to store it. So I'm really glad that we have an expert here in Alamo Bagano here for BEG Energy that's going to be able to talk about how to store energy. I think that's really important to be able to do. I'm in favor, we need to continue to be able to do everything that we're doing right now in producing energy. The traditional methods, I don't think are going to go away and I don't think they should go away. But I do think though that we need to double down, triple down, quadruple down on Energy Plus. What's Energy Plus? Energy plus is solar. Energy plus is wind. Energy plus is everything else that's not your traditional methods. These energy plus methods are going to be able to give us 
the opportunity to store the energy that we need. But I think that when we, when we, when we put different things, we talk about all these different things, we say, hey, Laredo needs to be at the forefront of all this stuff. We don't, we don't want to be left behind. I look, at, I look at the valley a few, you know, 20 years ago, and who would have ever thought? Would you have ever thought that Brownsville would be where it's at right now? Probably not. So I think, why can't Laredo be that? Why can't we be there? Why can't we be the, the innovators of change and the innovators of this? So we're going to continue to, to learn. Uh, I have, we have some really respected business leaders today that are, are really going out of their way to, to help us today and to help us understand how the return on, return on investment is favorable to businesses in the transportation and logistics industry. ROI. ROI is extremely important in the business world. I think nothing makes sense if it doesn't make sense for the ROI. We're going to have Roberto Perez from, from Forza Transportation. He's going to talk about that. And it's going to be very, very uh, mind opening for a lot of you when you hear his ROI and how fast he's gotten there. We're going to talk about to Al, Al Pequeño from EEG Energy and have a panel with Gonzalo Pida talking about the innovative way things that they're doing to keep electricity bills down and to keep storage, to store more energy and how we can continue to do that. Our window of opportunity right now is, is open. We can't, we can't settle. We can't think that our window of opportunity is going to stay there for a long time. We have to create urgency in what we're doing. We have to create urgency in being able to go out there and uh, figure out how we can get the federal dollars that we need for our community to help our businesses grow. Let's talk about we want our businesses to grow, we want our economy to grow, and we want to be able to stay far ahead and we want to lap all the other ports in, in terms of trade and we want to keep that number one uh, rank. But we only do that by running faster. And running faster is going to take adding energy plus. Energy plus is important. So thank you very much to all of the opportunities to be able to come in and, and, and speak today. Uh, I ask that you guys open your, open, just have a, an open mind to what's going on today. Remember that I don't foresee, and, and I don't, I, we're not going to get rid of any, any uh, in my opinion, you know, oil and gas is going to stick around, but how do we add to that? How do we continue to grow? How do we get better? How do we, get, how do we produce more energy? How do we store more energy? And remember that if we don't get this money, it's going to go to some other community. So thank you very much, and we look forward to a great day today. I work very hard to work with everybody in the capital. I don't care if you're a Democrat or Republican. I don't have any independence, per se. But I work very hard. I worked very hard, for example, to pass the property tax cut that we passed last year, which was my bill, the largest property tax cut in the history of the state of Texas. But I had to work very closely with Republicans to do that. But I do tell people, I'm a very proud Democrat, and I know this is not a, this is not a partisan event, but I think it is important. I tell people, look, we, we, I work very hard, and so does Henry. We work very hard with everyone, but there are differences between Democrats and Republicans. And we're here largely today because of the IRA, right? Inflation Reduction Act. Not a single Republican voted for that. Not a single Republican in the United States House of Representatives in the United States Senate. Okay? Some of them voted for the, the infrastructure bill, and I'm glad they did. None of them voted for the IRA. And so th those are the points of disagreement that we sometimes have. And that it doesn't make a difference who's in there. President Biden, Vice President Harris pushed very hard for that. Congressman Quaid and others worked very hard to pass the, the Inflation Reduction Act. And in large part because, as the Rio Grande International Study Center has done for so long and is continuing to do it, bring attention to the future. What are we going to do about the future? What, how are we preparing for the future, they even said. The future is now. It is truly today. Boy, you can, truer words could not have been spoken. The future is right now. And that's why we're here. 
And uh, so the Inflation Reduction Act is a very, very important part of that. When the statement is made that that legislation is the biggest piece of legislation that's ever been passed in this country to affect, to affect, try to affect climate change, which is real, it is, right? I mean, I tell people we've had global warming in that era since I was a kid, right? But it's gotten worse, and everybody knows it. It's gotten worse. And, and so this piece of legislation is very important. But the congressman mentioned, and I'm glad he said this, it's not a mandate. The law doesn't say you have to do this, right? It's an option. And I, and I want to thank the RGISC for bringing attention to this. And people like Alvaro Pequeño who brought attention to this, PG Energy, who brought attention to the fact that this is an opportunity for us in Laredo, in Texas, in this country, to have a real impact on our communities, to have a real impact on the future, our environment, our economic well-being, right? But it's not a mandate, but we have to want to do it. And so I thank all of you for being here. I thank the RGIS, RGISC, the Rio Grande Nourishing Study Center, for putting this together and continuing to bring attention to the fact that there are now tools, more tools. And thank you, Tricia, because you are a leader. Okay. Let's give Tricia a big hand, please. Thank you. And I, and I want to thank our two council women who are here. Who had more seniority? Oh, you're the same, right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> council woman, Elisa Segarro, and council woman, Elisa Segarro. And I want to thank them as well because they are also, they have been so involved in trying to bring attention to the fact that we've got to do more in looking at our future, making sure that we take into account how the environment plays into that. And what that means, again, not just for Laredo, but for Texas, and in our case, for, for two countries, because of where we're located. And let me side note, by the way, I hope that you all follow what's going on in Mexico. They had presidential election recently. We got an election coming up here. They had their presidential election. And a new president, Claudia Sheinbaum, right? Very, very impressive person a PhD in energy engineering, and really she is considered by many people to be a climatologist. I think she is going to bring more attention, clearly, bring more attention to the issue of the environment than anyone that's ever been president of Mexico, probably maybe even anyone that's been president of the United States. And I think that's going to be tremendous, not only for Mexico, but it's going to be tremendous for us here in the other two, in terms of the partnerships that I think we can help build by being an example of what we can do here in Laredo and what they can do in Mexico. Anyway, that's a side note, but I'm very, I'm very, very hopeful about her presidency and I'm, I'm excited about it. She'll be sworn into office in a couple of months. Um, I do want to mention, as Adrian said, uh, Adrian mentioned uh, that I talked about this the other day. So I sit on the State Affairs Committee, one of the, one of the most important committees up in Austin. It's very hard to get on there, but I'm on there because I've got a number of years in the legislature and so that allows me, with my seniority in the, in the House, to be on the State Affairs Committee. Everybody wants to be on there, but only a few of us can. But we have oversight of the grid. We have oversight of ERCOT, the PUC, etc. And, you know, we had a hearing a few weeks ago, and we had the chair, the head of, of, of ERCOT, President of ERCOT, Pablo Vegas, came and testified in front of the committee. And he talked about what our grid demands are right now, what our power demands are in the state of Texas. So we, the most that we've got to is around 85 gigawatts. Above 84 gigawatts, close to 85 gigawatts. That's been our peak demand. But what the testimony was, is what they could tell, what they see, is that by 2030, which is six years from now, by 2030, the demand they anticipate will reach 150. You think about that from 85 to 150. That's just mind-blowing. And, and, it, it, and so when the future, when everyone said the future is today, it is today. And so we have to do more and more to look at sustainable energy. That's why, that's why I have pushed, and a lot of us have pushed for alternative, or alternative energy, right? Wind, air, I mean, wind, uh, uh, solar, batteries. 
We have to because we've got to keep building the grid in a sustainable way. Oil and gas is very important. Fossil fuels are important. And one of the things that I started pushing many, many years ago, I was one of the early guys to push for CNG, compressed natural gas, because compressed natural gas and the more and more, you know, 18 wheelers, for example, buses, etc. I helped pass legislation so that schools could, could uh, uh, you know, retool their buses from diesel to CNG to compress natural gas because the particulates are so much, there's so much less pollution if you have compressed natural gas buses than if you have, you know, diesel. Similarly, we have to continue to do that uh, with reference to renewables. The renewables, I would say especially, especially solar. We got a lot of sun in Texas. We got a lot of sun in La Dela, but we got a lot of sun in Texas. And, and those panels last a long, long time. So the more that we can put into the grid from renewables, from sustainably renewables, you know, like solar, like wind, and then we know that in the state of Texas, what we see up in Austin is that there's more and more investment in battery storage. So that when that is being created, when that energy is being created during the day, with reference to solar panels, you can store it so you can use it at night, right? Um, so that's part of what we have focused, that's part of what I focused on in Austin. Uh, and I know that, I don't know, Ed, are you going to say, or someone from TechStock going to talk a little bit? Well, TechStock, is, you know, what we've done at the state level through TCEQ, Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, in 2001 we established a TURP, the Texas Environmental Protection Plan, and Environmental Reduction Plan is that since 2001 to today, we've invested now, I don't know what it's sold to, this year it's about 330 million, next year will be another 340 million, uh, but over the course of those 20 some years now, it's in the billions, that we have invested in trying to get more trucks out there, diesel trucks in particular, and, and others, you know, to retool to where they're, you know, emitting less uh, pollutants particulates is what they call them, right? And, and so that is a program that still exists. That's a program that we continue to, at the state level, put more and more money in every year uh, to dovetail now to what the, the IRA is doing, the Inflation Reduction Act, allowing and giving more opportunity to companies here in Latino and really all over uh, to, to be able to retool so that you can not only affect the environment, but candidly, so that companies can, can uh, sort of prepare for the future and what their future holds. Here in Laredo, one of the things that I'm excited about, I talked about this in Austin, I talked, I was in Israel actually, it was a few weeks ago, I talked about it in Israel, is that we're the largest business port in the United States of America. And I'm very excited about that. And it is exciting. But what I think it also gives us, because in our case, we don't have a water port, we don't have ships, it's trucks. Yes, it's trains as well, but the great majority, Reggie, the great majority are trucks, 18 wheelers. So I believe that what that allows us is an opportunity to become an example of what you can do in terms of EV. And we're going to talk a lot about, I hope we'll talk more, uh, I don't know another we'll talk about EV, but that we can, we can be the example for the rest of the country of what you can do with EV, right? Like vehicles with reference to the 18 wheelers because we've got so many of them coming through here. So as we focus on that here in Laredo, we focus on the amount of trade that's coming through here, the, the estimates are within four to five years, we will have, I think Dr. Covarrubas can speak to this, we will have in the neighborhood of a trillion dollars of trade in a year coming through here. A trillion dollars, if you can even imagine what that means. But what it does mean is that there's gonna be a lot of trucks coming in and out of Laredo, Texas, right? So it offers us an opportunity to be a great example of what can be with reference to renewable energy, with re reference to EV vehicles, with reference specifically to 18-wheelers because they're the ones that pollute the most, right? A lot more is an 18-wheeler, I can't remember what the number is, but that equals to a number of cars, a bunch. So, you know, I just want to, I wanted to come and say that we at the state level, through the TCEQ and through TxDOT doing more and more, in the non-attainment areas, and unfortunately more areas of Texas are non-attainment air quality areas, but but we work with Texas as well to try to figure out what are the things that we can do to reduce this pollution, you know, pollution.
motion in all of our areas. And here, uh, I again, I, I'm, I'm committed to it. I'm excited about it. I'm excited about the opportunity that we can be an example for the rest of the country. Not only in terms of how, how you can trade, but in terms of how you reduce emissions, how you improve our air quality, because we have a wonderful, well, we have an opportunity, I should put it that way. We have a great opportunity to say, hey, yeah, we got, we got a great economic impact going on here, but we also understand that because of that, that we're unique, we don't have ships, that we have a chance also to prove to you that the Inflation Reduction Act and the Texas Environment, the TURP program, the Texas Environment, the TCEQ, and, and the things that Texas are doing, should, we, we can show the rest of the state and the rest of the country that we are a laboratory for a wonderful environmental experience that can have a tremendously positive impact on our air quality so, and our health. So thank you. That's, that, I know that's not a long presentation, but I, but I want you to know at the state level we're doing as much as we can. I wish we could do more. Uh, if I were governor, we probably would, you know. But I'm not. I've got to go with Greg Abbott for now. Uh, but I also want to publicly thank Congressman Gwad for championing the Inflation Reduction Act in Washington, because I know he was one of those who championed it, and I want to thank President Biden for having signed that bill. It's historic. And we in not have had the opportunity to use it, but we need those folks in here who are leaders in our community, particularly in the private sector and our business community, to take advantage of it and become an example for the rest of the state and the rest of the country. But what I wanted to share with you was that what here at the city, city council, what we're trying to deal with and how we see the um, ability for the city to support and promote our trucking industry, how we're partners in all of this, you know, my husband and I came to Laredo in 1993, so the Columbia Bridge had just been up for a little bit, and World Trade Bridge was still several years away, but we came here right before NAFTA. And you could drive on 35 and never see too many cars out there, very slow pace. Think about the change that has occurred in the next 30 years. 30 years is not a long time, and we are a powerhouse. When they say we're the number one port, that's the number one land port in the world, the ninth largest port in the world. That's what happens here. So of course, there are going to be growing pains. We have neighborhoods that abut these bridges. The bridges, the city of Laredo has invested so much to try to make sure that trade flows well, because we understand that's how the trucking industry moves. If we can help make that port bridge infrastructure better, then it rebounds to the economy and the trucking industry that's running through here. It's a partnership. So the city has worked very hard to make sure that we can keep up, we can innovate. It is, it, we can't deny though that there are challenges because we do have these historic um, land use plans that didn't recognize the tremendous growth that would occur. And we have neighborhoods abutting these industrial corridors, these um, bridges, and the traffic is um, always congested. You have residential fighting with commercial, and that's just how we developed. A lot of it, I think, had to do with the rapid growth. What can we do now? What well, we can do better? And um, I don't know if TxDOT will be speaking later to talk about how they're working to make it better. But as a city, we certainly are trying to make sure we're promoting industry and keeping the trade flow going, while at the same time making life here in our city good for the citizens that live here and who are supporting the industry that feeds the rest of the United States. It's a partnership. So that means at the city level, we need to do everything we can to support industry while at the same time protect public health, right? It's not meant to be in contention. It's meant to be in collaboration. And I think what this electrification push is, is just that. 
a collaboration between how we improve the quality of life in our city and take advantage of this great economic engine that this trucking industry brings to us, while at the same time, how do we protect public health? How do we increase the quality of life? How do we solve the congestion issues that are at the core of what a city's duties are to the people who live here? So um, I'm excited about the opportunity that the Biden administration has provided with the Inflation Reduction Act dollars, federal money, and the, the, um, infra the bipartisan infrastructure law. If we, like, I want to just repeat, I think what Adrian was saying, if we don't take advantage of the opportunities that are presented to us, at least at the city level, we do a disservice to the taxpayers who um, will foot the bill in many other ways. If we can't get the help to promote our bridges and get the trade flow going faster, and if we, uh, you know, it's taxpayer dollars that has to do that. If we can't help protect the public health, that comes out of the pockets of families who live here. So let's work together to move into the future because that is what Laredo has always done. We've gone from zero to, well, not quite zero, but really just a little small sleepy town to this powerhouse on the world stage that feeds the country all of its products and needs. 40% of all the trade comes through our port, and that is only growing. We see a 5% increase in trade every single year, and sometimes it's even higher than that. So together, let's meet our challenges and, and just create a better city for us to live in. Thank you so much.